Well, we are returning now finally to Acts chapter, to the book of Acts chapter 12. Um, I guess we returned there two weeks ago, so this isn't like a grand reunion or anything. This is just going back to where we left off. Um, I wasn't here last week. That was not, that was uh, planned. Uh, it wasn't planned that I wouldn't be here. It was planned that I wouldn't preach though, but God saw fit to provide as he did. And many of you heard that Rosita went through a uh, an emergency procedure. She is well and well enough even to be up at the winter retreat. So we praise God also uh, for that. So Acts chapter 12. Let me ask you though first before we <clears throat> read, what was the price of our atonement? Peter tells us that we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. To us, the, the price of our atonement, it was free. But only because Christ paid the full price of his life for us. And while our atonement is free in Christ, there is a cost to following him that we must count. Jesus said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What does it look like to carry your cross? I can't tell you what it will look like for you. But let me tell you what it has looked like for one man, Pastor Sayyid Abedini. Abedini was born in Iran and he was raised a Muslim. In the year 2000, at the age of 20, he converted to Christianity. He converted after he was recruited by a radical Muslim group, and he underwent training to become a suicide bomber. And the experience left him so depressed that this was the, event, this was the circumstances that ultimately led him to Christ. And after his conversion, Abedini became active in Iran's house church movement. Although the Iranian constitution recognizes Christianity as a minority religion, Christians, especially Muslim converts to Christianity, have faced persecution from the post-revolutionary government in Iran, making it safer for Christians to worship in underground communities. At the time of his arrest, Abedini's home church movement had established 100 churches in 30 Iranian citizens with well over 2,000 members. Abedini and his wife fled to the United States after conservative Iranian politician uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad became president in 2005. And Abedini became involved with a church in Boise, Idaho, and later became a U.S. citizen, making him a dual Iranian-American national. In 2009, Abedini took his wife and his two children to Iran for his first visit back. And on their way home, Iranian authorities stopped Abedini. They detained and interrogated him. And in exchange for his release and the freedom to continue visiting Iran, Abedini signed a written agreement with the government to abstain from participation in the house church movement. Between 2009 and 2012, Abedini visited Iran nine times. And during these visits, he abided by his agreement, and he was involved only in humanitarian relief. But on September 26, 2012, during what was intended to be a short trip from his home in Idaho to Iran to visit family and to work on an orphanage he was building in Rasht, he was arrested and charged with crimes relating to his house church work. And for over three years, he endured brutal interrogation, beatings, months of solitary confinement, where the only thing he did was pray, sometimes for 20 hours straight. Following Christ cost Abedini his freedom, his well-being. It very easily could have cost him his life. He said that he was brought out on several occasions to witness the executions of other prisoners, making it clear that this could be you. Is Christ worthy of such a high cost? Is this? Well, the short answer to the question is Christ is worth the cost to follow him. 
And that also happens to be the title of my sermon this morning. Christ is worth the cost to follow him. And as you'll see as we walk through chapter 12 of the book of Acts, that those who know the worth of Christ will follow him utterly, dependently, and expectantly. Those who know the worth of Christ will follow him utterly, dependently, and expectantly. Let's read together the first part, the first five verses of chapter 12, and then we'll pray. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, that you have had mercy upon us as sinners when we deserved justly your condemnation. It was your will that we would instead know your grace through Jesus Christ. You chose a people before the foundation of the world, but that people was only brought to you through the realization of their sin through the the realization of their worthiness of condemnation and through the amazing realization that you offer them forgiveness and pardon in Christ because he took our place. He paid the cost of our atonement. And it wasn't just anyone who did this. It, It was the Son of God. It was God himself who came down and took our place. The judge took off his robe and put on the chains and went to the execution in our place. And we stand back in amazement. Such a display of love and grace cannot leave us unchanged. No, it brings us to faith in this glorious Son, this glorious Christ. We are humbled before you that you would show us this kindness. And that should lead us somewhere else too. It should lead us to want to go wherever he goes, to follow. But we understand that your requirement is that we must take up our cross to follow you. And the only way we will do that is if we truly see the worth of Christ. So may you use this morning to bring, even in a feeble effort of my own, to bring the worth of Christ before our eyes. Spirit of God, I pray that you will be the one to cause us to be overwhelmed with such beauty. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus has not hid from us the fact that our calling to follow him will cost us things that this world holds dear. Popularity, possessions, reputation, relationships, health, riches, homes, freedom, and yes, as you know, even perhaps your life. Jesus told his disciples, he said, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. The emblem of Christ's call to discipleship is a cross, an instrument of execution, which we, as his followers, are to take up and take with us wherever he leads. This means that as those who profess to follow Jesus, that we need to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received.
from the Lord Jesus. You know, with, with such a high cost, why would anyone agree to such terms? Why would anyone be a disciple if simply following might cost you everything? And the simple answer is Christ is worth the cost to follow him. You know, the reason something is valuable or expensive is, is a combination of many things. It's, it's rare, it's unique, it's desirable or exquisite. You know, in November of, of last year, the world's most expensive diamond was sold at Sotheby's auction house in Geneva. It was sold for $48.4 million. It was called the Blue Moon Diamond. It weighs in at a hefty 12.03 carats. It's supposedly an exceptionally vivid blue. The diamond is one of a kind. It's exquisitely beautiful, which makes it greatly desirable. But is it worth dying for? I'm, I'm sure there's probably some who would say, yeah. That doesn't really make much sense, though, does it? How can you enjoy something if you're dead? What about dying for your country? Right? Of, of course, there, there's... There's much that could go into a discussion like this, which I'm not going to go into, but, but suffice it to say that there are those who see their country as unique, right? Needful in what it stands for in the world and the preservation of those ideals as well as the protection of those they love who live in their home. They would say, yes, I would lay down my life for that. They see it really as their duty to be willing to do that, right? Li uh, lives and ideals these are things that we understand and we know that they're valuable and certainly they're more valuable than just mere possessions. Jesus even said, greater love has no one than this than he who lays down his life for his friend. You know what? What about my, my willingness to lay down my life for my wife? This, this grows out of, out of her worth to me. She's my wife by covenant. She is one flesh to me by union. And it's my duty before God to love her as I love myself and to protect her at the expense even of my life. Even the world accepts this to be true. And they would call a man a coward if he put his own well-being before that of his wife. And as we know, such duty, it doesn't come from man. It's not some, something noble that generates from within man. No, marriage and the duty of a husband to protect his wife, it's foundational to every society on earth. And this is because God made marriage. He, he's the one who inbred, in, 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 inbred within us an understanding of the roles and the responsibility in marriage that they were given to man by God. He's the one who tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. But notice that God does not call me to lay down my life for your wife nor for you to lay down your life for my wife. He says, husbands love your wives. You know, even in all our sin and rebellion, we, <clears throat> we, we, we cannot shake off <clears throat> such fundamental truths. They're accepted. They're ingrained in us. But if you are going to follow Jesus, regardless of who you are, man, woman, child, married, single, rich, poor. Jesus requires that you be willing to lay down your life for him. He says, he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Why? Is it, is it obligation? Is it, is it duty? Is it because he's unique? Valuable? Well, we're certainly getting closer, but we're not there yet. Christ is unique and is valuable, even infinitely so. Or to say it another way, whatever the cost might be in following him, 
even if it is your life, Christ declares he is worthy. If following Christ leads to your death, you are not throwing away your life as you would be if you died for a valuable possession like a diamond. You are not performing a duty that is expected of you. No. Christ tells you you are actually gaining your life. He says he who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. See, following Christ may cost you your life in this world, but because of Christ and who he is, you gain something more valuable than the life you gave up. You gain life himself. You gain Christ. The infinite worth of Christ, it's rooted in who he is and what he's done. He is the eternal God, the second person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, and through whom and for whom all things were created, who is blessed forever. Amen. In 1 Peter 2, Peter is writing to new believers. You can turn there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. He's writing to new believers. He's telling them about the one that they have come to faith in. And he tells them in verse 4, he says, And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. And because he's choice and precious in the sight of God, we who are his children We feel the same way. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. What the father loves, his children love. And so in verse 6, he says, For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then, it's for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. See, coming to Christ is not simply believing certain facts are true. That Jesus is God and he died for your sins. No, when Christ saves you, you are born again as a new creature in Christ with a new nature and new desires that flow forth from this nature. And the evidence of this new nature is that you desire Christ. And you cherish him as precious. He's precious above all else, even all else, even my life. How precious? How much is Jesus worth? You know, we are we are creatures. We are filled with the de- with desires of every sort, good and bad. Where does Jesus rank on the scale of your desires? Jesus told a parable one time that describes how precious it really is to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And since he himself is the king of that kingdom and the one who makes that kingdom valuable, the parable applies to him as well. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field and when a man found and hid it, which a man found and he hid again and from joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys the field Notice that the man does not sell all that he has begrudgingly. He does it joyfully, right? The reason is because he sees how precious the treasure is in that field. He knows that whatever the cost for that field, he's coming out ahead, way ahead. I'll sell it all to gain that field. Jesus is worth so much more than anything else in this world that every loss endured to have more of him can be endured with joy. With joy. And look at what this one of infinite worth did. As Paul tells us in Philippians 2, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here is why Jesus is worth the cost of following him, even to the point of your life. Because even though you had no merit in yourself and were actually worthy of condemnation, the most precious, unique, exquisitely beautiful being that exists willingly set aside the splendor of his glory as God to become a man and die in your place. And like the woman who was caught in adultery, whom Christ forgave, he said, like her, he says, you have been forgiven much and so you will love what? Much. You will love much. So much so that you gladly account your life as nothing in comparison to the value of possessing him. If this is how you see Christ and what he has done for you, you can join with Paul saying, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. What is your life in comparison to him? Paul compared it to something from the Old Testament, a drink offering poured out upon the altar of God as worship. If you would have me pour out my life as an offering, Lord, I would do it as worship unto you. Such is your worth. Such is your worth. And if you do not see Christ this way, I imagine some of you are going, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know if I see him this way. If you do not love him to such a degree that you would willingly sacrifice your life, I'm not saying it would be easy. I'm not saying you seek it out by no means. But that if it were put to it, deny Christ or die, that you would pour out your life. Take it. It's of no value to me. Christ is of greater value, and I gain him. If that's not how you see Christ, you have to ask yourself, am I truly following him? Because Christ says you can't follow him if you won't take up your cross. You're not worthy of him. That's what he says. Christ won't let you follow him. You can think you're following him, but he's told you the criteria. He won't let you because you don't see his infinite worth. You don't value what he did for you. And if your life is more valuable to you than Christ, then you don't know him. I tell you that in love. You don't know him. Here's how the author of Hebrews put it. He said, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. That's a picture. Outside the gate of the city of God, he was, he was put outside of the presence of God to suffer for you. That's the statement of his worth. The infinitely worthy one suffered for you so you would not be infinitely condemned. And what's the response of the one who understands who it is who has suffered for them? He goes on to say, so let us go out to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here, we, we do not have a lasting city. We're seeking the city which is to come. 
Here's how you know if you see the infinite worth of Christ. You see this world for what it is. It's a city that will not last. And you see Christ for who he is. The glorious one who died for you and so you'll follow him. You'll go outside the city. You'll go outside the camp and you'll consider it a joy to bear his reproach should that be where following him leads you. Those who know the worth of Christ, first of all, will follow him utterly. Follow Christ utterly. And to call this an application of my sermon this morning is really somewhat pointless. It's like telling a mother to love her baby. Such love is natural. It is instinctive. Such, so much so that <clears throat> any lack of love indicates, thank you, <clears throat> any lack of such love indicates that there is a serious problem. A mother who doesn't love her baby, it's not natural. It's not right. There is a problem. And a Christian who doesn't love his Savior, even to the point of his life, is not natural. There's a problem. You're not seeing something that you need to see. Now, we have two examples in our text today of men <clears throat> who knew the worth of Christ and therefore followed him utterly. James and Peter. Now, we know who Peter was. If we've been here and we've been going through the book of Acts, we've been introduced to Peter already. But James, we need to know a little bit about him. Which, by the first one is, which James are we talking about? There's actually three of them in the New Testament. There, there's James the just, that's the Lord's half-brother. There's James the less, as he's been called, the son of Alphaeus. And then he was one of the twelve. And then there's James, the brother of John, also an apostle. So the only thing we know about James the less is his name. We're not told anything other than that. The son of Alphaeus. So we're not talking about him. In verse 17, after Peter escapes prison here in chapter 12, um, he tells them to report the events to James and the brethren. So this, this is the other James that is now left alive, and that's referring to Jesus, uh, half-brother James. And so the James that we're speaking of here in verse 2 is John's brother, the son of Zebedee, one of the sons of Zebedee. James was one of the three most prominent leaders of the Jerusalem church. Peter, James, John, they were all firsts among equals. Uh, before encountering Jesus, James and his brother John had a thriving fishing business in Galilee. After leaving that to follow Jesus, these two gained the nickname Sons of Thunder when they suggested that Jesus send down fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans who had rejected Jesus' message. Along with John and Peter, James was one of Jesus' inner three who was permitted to go in with Jesus when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and he also witnessed Jesus' glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Perhaps it was these very things being included on these these experiences, knowing it was just the three of them, James being one of them, might, these are, might have been some of the things that went to the heads of James and John and causing an argument at one time between them over which one was regarded the greatest. Their mother, Salome, or Salome, also thought pretty highly of her boys. She asked Jesus on one occasion that they be allowed to sit on each side of Jesus in his kingdom. Jesus told her that his father was the one who decides who will be where in the kingdom, but that, that they would most certainly drink the same cup that he was about to drink. And in relation to James, that time comes here in this chapter. Luke tells us in verse 1, he says, back in chapter 12, he says, Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Now, not only are there three different James, there's even more Herods that we refer to in the New Testament. Um, this one that we're talking about is Herod Agrippa I. Agrippa 
was the grandson of another Herod that we know. That would be Herod the Great, who several decades earlier was the one who sought to kill the male children in Bethlehem two years old and younger. Now, when Herod the Great died just a short while after this incident with Bethlehem, his kingdom was divided between his three sons, Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, and Herod Philip. Herod Antipas was the one who was responsible for beheading John the Baptist when he divorced his wife and married the wife of his brother, Philip. Antipas was also the one involved in the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, he was the uncle of Herod Agrippa, the one we're talking about now. Antipas was the uncle of Agrippa. Antipas eventually fell out of favor with the emperor Caligula around 41 AD. He was exiled, and his rule over Palestine was essentially handed over to Agrippa. So the grandson of Herod the Great and the uncle of Herod Antipas is the Agrippa, Herod Agrippa that we're talking about here. He more than likely spent significant time with his uncle growing up in his, during his reign, and so he was very familiar perhaps with the events surrounding the execution of Jesus and, his, and then the, the disciples that were following him. And in the 10 years it's been now since this reported raising from the dead of Jesus, the followers of this Jesus had now grown to a sizable number and they were now being referred to by people as Christians. They have a name. The Jews had always been a difficult people to keep under control, even in the best of times. And so Agrippa may well have begun a policy of persecution directed against the Christians in an effort to gain favor with the Jews. And it's likely that he tested the merits of this plan by arresting and executing one of their leaders, James. Verse 2 says, And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Now, the disciples knew times were difficult. They, they, they had been subjected to persecution at the hands of the Jews already. Uh, they had killed, they had, the Jews as a mob had already executed Stephen, which sent many out. Even to the last chapter, we've seen that it sent a number of Jews out from Jerusalem to Antioch. And the church was beginning to grow as Gentiles were embracing faith in Jesus as Lord and Christ. Perhaps that was some of what was going through Herod's mind as he decided, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, this favor for the Jews and see how they take it. But so persecution was in the air. But the lack of details that Luke provides here in verse 2 suggests that the event may have transpired rather quickly. Almost like, oh, James has been taken. And then someone comes through the door, James is dead. That quick to where it was like he, they'd seen other of their leaders taken before, but they were held in prison and, and there was time there. But this, he was taken and summarily executed. And so it must have shocked them, stunned them. And this is the only death of one of the apostles recorded in Scripture. The news, as I said, must have come as a massive shock to the disciples in Jerusalem. James was still very young. He was zealous. It would be easy to think of how useful he could have been in the ministry. We have a few men that we could add to such a list like this. Men like Robert Murray McShane, who died at 33. David Brainerd, who died at 29. Jim Elliott, also at 29. You know, it's natural for us to wonder why God, in his sovereignty, would allow such useful men to die so young. But this is one of the ways that, that we must walk by faith in this life. God has his purposes and and. He may never, we may never know this side of heaven, why he would choose to do these things. But essentially, God calls us to faith. 
He calls us to serve. And when the works that he has prepared for us are done, well, then he calls us home. Their work was done. We could line up a whole list of things that we think they should be involved in. God says, no, the work I gave them is done. Time for them to come home. You know, in 1904, William Borden, who was the heir to the Borden Dairy estate, he graduated from a Chicago high school, a millionaire, like Borden Dairy, right? His parents gave him a trip around the world, traveling through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. It gave Borden a burden for the world's hurting people. And so this young man, he wrote home and he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. When he made this decision, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words. He said, no reserves. And after graduating from Yale University, he turned down high-paying job offers. He entered two more words in his Bible, no retreats. Completing studies at Princeton Seminary, Borden settled for work uh, for, for China. I sorry, excuse me. He sailed for China to begin a work with Muslims, stopping first at Egypt for some preparation. And while he was there, <clears throat> he was stricken with cerebral meningitis and died within a month. He was 25 years old. And news of, of his death his mission, and his character, they were covered in nearly every newspaper in the United States, as was the message that was written in the back of his Bible. Just before his death, William Borden had added, after the sentences, no reserve, no retreat, one last sentence, no regrets. Christ was worthy. Borden followed him utterly. There was nothing to regret. Now it says, when Herod saw, in verse 3, that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Herod figured it, it went well the first time. He might as well move on to the next leader. And the rest of the verse says, it was during the days of unleavened bread, which meant that he needed to wait until Passover was over before he could bring Peter out and execute him, as he did with James. And so after seizing him... He put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Herod must have heard of Peter's previous escapes, perhaps, from the public jail when he was with the Jews. Back in chapter 5, verse, because it says in verse 6 that Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. You're not getting out of this one, Peter. It would seem Herod intended Peter to suffer the same fate as James. Uh, the church, though, was ready this time. It says in verse 5, So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God, church to God. So these disciples knew the worth of Christ, and so not only were they following him utterly, they were also following him dependently. And we must do the same, follow Christ dependently. If you're going to follow him utterly, you have got to follow him dependently. Do you ever wonder why you should even pray? Has the thought crossed your mind? You know that God is sovereign, or at least that's what's being preached from this pulpit and taught in this church. God is sovereign over all things. Everything that happens, God is in control over it. He rules and He reigns all things for His glory and the good of His people. You know, if God wants to save your neighbor, you know He will. What does it matter whether or not you pray and ask God to save your neighbor? Because if God's going to save him, he's going to save him anyway, whether or not you pray. So what does it matter? God knows what we need. He's wise. He's omniscient, right? All-knowing. Isn't, really, isn't it really just an exercise in futility? Even perhaps arrogance to... For us to presume that we could tell God what we need or what we'd like Him to happen? You know, if He ordains all things and what He ordains is best, then what purpose is, is served by my praying to Him? These are valid questions. They might even be questions you've asked yourself and thinking right now, that's a good question. You can answer that, please, for me. I will try. Yes, God is sovereign. 
Yes, God does what he pleases. Yes, he is wise and knows all things. But should this lead us to such a fatalistic view of prayer and and to just simply dismiss it from our lives because it doesn't seem to have a pragmatic value? Whether or not prayer works, we even know that we must participate in it for no other reason simply than that God commands it. And if you've read even just a little bit of the New Testament, you can see that God expects His people to pray. Now, what should also be clear is that prayer does indeed work in some sense. James, this one, the Lord's brother here, he said this about it, and it was about as clear as anybody could say it in James chapter 4, verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask. So, God is in control, but he says he also responds to our prayers. Now, God being sovereign does not mean that we are puppets. God has not made things that way. That's a distortion of Christianity. That's not truth. The scriptures teach us that God accomplishes his sovereign purposes And he does them through earthly and human means. Take witnessing, for example. He's sovereign over salvation. We gladly preach that. He's the one who calls, and you only came because he called your name. You're a sheep, he's the shepherd, and if you're his, he calls, you come. However, he has sovereignly sovereignly declared the means of salvation to be through hearing and believing the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You came because you heard the gospel. Someone shared the gospel with you and pointed you to Christ, and you believed. Now, prayer is another means through which God accomplishes his sovereign purposes. He invites you to bring your needs to him, and he tells you that if you don't ask... Don't expect to receive. In other words, God has both ordained the means as well as the ends. R.C. Sproul, he gives a helpful example. He says, what would you think of a farmer when the spring comes, sits on the porch in his rocking chair, folds his hands and say, well, I sure hope we have a great harvest this year. I hope that it's the plan of God to give us abundant crops. He doesn't plow his fields. He doesn't plant the seed. He doesn't weed the rows. He sits there and he waits for God to deliver him a harvest from heaven. That's not how a farmer works. If a farmer ever did try to farm that way, I think it's clear what would happen. His benefit from the hand of God would be zero. We're called to plow our fields. We're called to plant and to water, and this calling applies to our prayers, right? We take that, um, Paul used that very thing. Who's the one who causes the growth? God, we plant, we sow. See, we can add prayer to the many things which God is sovereign over, but which we are also responsible, such as our sanctification. We can't just sit there and, oh, God, help me hate sin. Oh, God, help me not want to sin. When he tells us, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. We can't say, oh, God, I need to know your will for my life. Just just give me a sign. When God says, no, the mind of man plans his way, but God directs his steps. See, there are so many things that we just want God to do, and he says, I'm not going to do it for you. I'll be the one who does it, and you're going to join me in that. You're going to sweat. You're going to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're going to trust me. And it's not because I zap you. It's because you choose to believe, and you fill your mind with truth. And you flee from things that you need to flee from. When you start making the right choices, I start doing what only I can do. Sovereignty and responsibility together. That's God's perfect design. And so the church, they gathered to beseech the Lord to deliver Peter. And and from this, Luke reminds us that we are to follow Christ dependently. 
taking our needs to him in prayer. And verse 5, there's four things just that we can grab really quickly from verse 5. We need to pray corporately. The need was great, and so the church gathered to pray. It's not about the number of people praying as if the more prayers we throw at God, it'll be like, okay, okay. That's not it. That's a pagan concept. He, he does that to give us an illustration of, of taking our needs before him continually, but it's not like the more prayers we amass, the more he has to do what we say. No, that's pagan. Rather, it's the value of praying corporately as a church, God's people together. The minds and the hearts of God's people, they are being brought together on a matter. They're coming together to pray, to beseech God corporately. We're to pray earnestly. As soon as Herod put Peter in prison the church began to pray. And they kept praying until he was released in the middle of the night. Notice that. They started praying when he was put in prison. And since Passover had begun, we're to understand that probably there were a couple days involved here. And when he was released in the middle of the night and went to the house, they were praying. So they were seeking God earnestly on this matter. Ian Bounds once wrote, he said, only God can move mountains, but faith and prayer move God. They didn't give up. They kept praying earnestly. We're to pray deliberately. As the church prayed corporately and earnestly, they also prayed deliberately. There is, there's much evidence in Acts that meetings for prayer, these were regular occurrences. The, the church was called the house of prayer. But this is not just a prayer meeting. Hey, guys, prayer meeting tonight. No. Sound the alarm. Gather at John Mark's house, Peter's in prison, and he's going the way of James unless we beseech the Lord. And so they prayed deliberately. And there are times in the life of church, of the church when deliberate prayer meetings are required. There's a need, gather, drop everything if you can, and come and pray with, your, with the body of Christ. We need to beseech the Lord. And lastly, we need to pray interdependently. Verse 12 says that there were many gathered to pray. We are a family in Christ. We are a local body and we, we function as a family. And, we, and like family, maybe your family, not, not so much, but this family, the Lord's family seeks to be together. They seek one another out. In one accord, they lifted their voices to God for the sake of Peter. And a church that seeks to gather like this for the purpose of God, to gather and, and mingle with one another and our hearts are knitted together through this. He says, you're functioning like a body, Paul says. He says, you're, you're fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part which causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. He says, when, you're, when you see prayer, corporate prayer, deliberate prayer, you see it as we got to get together with the church there's a prayer meeting tonight and we need to be there. He says, now you've got the right understanding of what prayer is to be in the church. It's the powerhouse of the church. Now, what was the result of this corporate, earnest, deliberate, interdependent prayer meeting of the church? Well, Luke provides us a very detailed description in verses 6 to 11. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, gird your, yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. None of those who were praying had any idea that God was answering their prayer abundantly beyond all that they could ask or think. And what's ironic is that as great a story as this is of the efficacy and the importance of prayer, apparently no one there actually expected God to deliver Peter. 
Luke says that Peter went to the home of John Mark, where he knew that they would be, because this is where they gathered. He knocked on the door, and when the servant girl answered, she was so overjoyed at the sight of Peter that she left him standing there and ran off to tell the others who were praying. She never even opened the door. Verse 14 says that she ran in and she announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate, and they said to her, you're out of your mind. She kept insisting, he's out there. It's his angel. He's dead already. It's as almost they were, as if they were saying, hey, her name was Rhoda. Rhoda, Rhoda, settle down. Please stop. Okay, you're interrupting our prayers for Peter. <laughs> well, he's outside. How often we pray while never expecting an answer, at least, at least not in the ways that we expect. We have become so accustomed to just simply saying, well, you know, God's answer is no sometimes. We've, so, we've become so accustomed to saying that we, that we are caught off guard when God chooses to answer yes and so quickly. We're reminded that Christ is worthy to be followed utterly. He's worthy to be followed. And then therefore you must follow him dependently and you must follow him expectantly. If you're going to follow Christ utterly, follow him dependently and expectantly. Peter kept knocking at the door, perhaps with increasing intensity, like, come on, they're going to show up here. This was no secret place. So he had a short amount of time to let them know that he was okay and then to get out of there. It says in verse 16, but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and they were amazed. And when they saw Peter, they must have shouted, they must have cheered, everything in, in Verse 70 says, but, but motioning to them with his hands to be silent. No, don't draw attention. He described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. God heard your prayers. And he said, report these things to James, the half-brother of Jesus, and the brethren. And then he left them, went to another place. He couldn't stay in Jerusalem any longer. Many people pray like that. They, they prayed rightly, these people did, only they just didn't expect God to answer. In other words, they were just like us, just like we pray many times. If their prayers were effective, even though unbelieving, why should our prayers be any different? Shouldn't they be effective also? God is so kind. They were the same kind of folks that we are. It should remind us of what James says about Elijah. James 5, 17, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, no different than you or me. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. See, that's, that's there not so you go, wow, Elijah must have been a crazy, godly, righteous man. Uh, didn't I just tell you a nature just like ours? I'm trying to tell you something. Your prayers matter. Your prayers make a difference. They accomplish much. It is not a futile effort. You need to pray. If you're going to follow Jesus utterly, you'll never do it unless you're following him dependently and expectantly. That God will hear you when you cry out to him. God had saved one while allowing another to die. God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Christ is worth the cost to follow him. And none of us are essential to what God is doing, but all of us have work to do as we follow him. He's worthy. He is infinitely worthy. So, church, let's follow him utterly, dependently, and expectantly. Let's ask him to help us with that. Heavenly Father, we've seen, we've read an example of what you can do in people just like us. You can burden us to pray for things that you intend to do, and even our feeble efforts will move your hand. There are things today that we need to be praying for. There will be things tomorrow that we need to pray for. 
There will be urgent needs as those of us seek to follow you utterly and find ourselves in situations where our well-being is at stake, whether it be what we own or what we possess even up to the point of our life. And we will need to know that people are praying and uplifting us. Convince us of these things, Lord, first and foremost of your infinite worth. And if any say, I can't, I'm not following you that way, oh God, praise, praise you for opening eyes so that they would see now they're not following you and would not hear one day from Jesus himself, I never knew you, depart from me. Mercifully open our eyes to see the glory and the beauty of Christ so that our response is instinctive, I'll follow. It won't be easy. It won't be something that we just flippantly throw away. It's just that if we see that this is what it costs, we won't turn back. We won't look over our shoulder. We won't look back at other times and say, gosh, I wish I'd never become a Christian. We'll say, here's my life, Lord. I pour it out for your glory in worship to you. Only you can do this. Only you. And we pray and invite you to do it in our lives so that we can know that we're following you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Should we stand? The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son, who drank the bitter cup reserved for me.